Good morning and welcome. My name is Jeff and I'm so honored to be able to stand here where Kevin Witham normally does. If you're a guest like my family, I hope you've already found that this is a really friendly place that really does care about Escondido, cares about San Diego, but most importantly cares about Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen from the church on that? And welcome to Easter Sunday. My, uh, oh crumb, punch this. My phone constantly wants to tell me something exciting is happening somewhere. Uh, does yours do that as well? Well, before we get to what I want to say about my phone, I do want to give you an invitation to our Harbor Bible Lectures. They take place at Pepperdine each May, and if you'll go to that next slide, I think we've even got a slide with a QR code on it. Uh, we'd love to have you come and enjoy that. There'll be over 200 lectures from about 20 different states that'll be speaking. There'll be, oh, who knows, a couple thousand folks from all across the country, and you're invited. We open up the dorms. There's Ocean View Bedrooms in Malibu. You can get four nights and food for about 350 bucks. So you can't get that on Mission Bay, I'll, I'll tell you that. So let me encourage and invite you, if you don't know how to get there, I'm thinking a couple of folks, I think the Davenports might be able to show you the way to Pepperdine, as well as some others. How many have ever been to the university, been to Pepperdine? All right, great. Well, I hope to see you there. If you are a student, I want to invite you with that next slide to Crossways. Every year, we take 100 sophomores and juniors and work through what we call a life map, asking the question, not what do you want to be when you grow up, but how has God uniquely gifted and talented you? It's a leadership experience for students in the summer after their sophomore and junior year. Now I'm going to say something I normally can't say. Because of a generous donation that helped us to launch Crossways from the San Diego Christian Foundation, any student from any congregation here in this area gets to go free. So it doesn't even cost you the $250 tuition. So if you're a sophomore and a, or a junior right now and you're interested, get on and get that application in at pepperdine.edu forward slash crossways and just make a note there that you're from San Diego and you get the golden ticket. If you can't go this year, that's available next year and the year thereafter. So I've done my duty in, and it's doing, just a sec, I've got to hit a button here to make my phone. My phone does not want me to miss one piece of big news. Anybody else have this happen to you? And sometimes what my phone thinks is big news is not really big news, right? I mean, my phone is always telling me, oh, there's a flash flood warning. Anybody get one of those over this last weekend? Or there's breaking news on a battle. Or there's been tragically a shooting. Or here's what Taylor Swift had for lunch. I mean, big, <laughs> big deals. And I had to think, as I was thinking about this lesson, if there had been iPhones around on Easter Sunday, they would have all blown up, right? Big news, breaking news. Well-known rabbi is missing from his tomb. Some say that he is walking and alive. Big news that day, only the iPhones could not have put it in big enough print. Because what happened on Easter Sunday so long ago literally changed everyone's lives. It changed the way we keep time. We can't even say 2024 without recognizing that something happened 2024 years ago that was so astounding that the world said, we're just going to mark our time by it. You can't hardly drive through a city, whether it's San Diego or any place else, without noting crosses or the names of Jesus on some building. Or even occasionally a hospital that will say Memorial or Baptist or Presbyterian Hospital or Our Lady of Mercy. Because Jesus so changed our world. There are countless folks right at this time, or a few hours from now or a few hours ago, who were meeting in Hawaii, who were meeting in Beijing. And yes, there's a small group that's meeting in Kiev praying for peace, and God bring peace to our world. Amen. Amen. There were folks in Buenos Aires. In fact, we've got some students from Pepperdine down there who will be celebrating Easter there. There are folks in London. There are folks in Switzerland. Yes, there are folks in Moscow who are pausing to say, 
Jesus rose. In fact, just in case the person next to you doesn't know it, because it's really good news, and some of you appear not to have had much good news recently, so just turn to the person next to you and say, He is risen. Go ahead and tell them, He is risen. That puts some smiles on faces out there, if nothing else, for saying, Whoa, man, take a mint. Uh, All right. Let me read a little bit from the book of Luke to get us started, if I can. They found the stone rolled away. Can I get a hallelujah from you on that? That one to two ton stone that was put there, not so anybody inside could not get out. You need to understand that wasn't designed to trap a dead person. It was designed to keep nobody from messing with their remains. In fact, the Roman soldiers were so worried about it that the government had them put a little cord on it that had the mark of Rome so that anyone who messed with it, it's kind of like a mailbox, that's a federal problem if you touch that tomb. But that stone, that cord, that marker, the Roman guard unit that was there was gone. But when they entered, can you read this part with me? They did not find the of the Lord, which begins the greatest mystery for some folks. What happened to his body? Was his body stolen? Did some group sneak up and and do it? Who would have done it? Oh, the disciples did it. That's right. That group of ragtag fishermen and tax collectors snuck up on a marine uh, group and just, you know, over overcome that platoon, rolled that stone out of the way, and then took the body, and then they lied about it. Why? So they could be uh, beaten, whipped, sawed in half. You know, those kind of things. The things that typically motivate someone to tell a lie. Can I get an oh no from anybody here on that? No, I I don't agree with that uh, answer for the mystery either. But rather that something miraculous happened. And while they were, these are the ladies who went to anoint the body, while they were wondering about this, suddenly, two men, We're going to talk this morning about two men. It's interesting how two show up in Scripture. Two men. In the Old Testament, you couldn't have given a testimony and have it stand up in court unless there were, say it with me, yes, and unfortunately, ladies, sorry, it would have to be men. Two men in clothes that gleamed like what? Lightning stood beside them. In their fright, of course, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living? I love this line. Among what? Among the dead. He is not here. Say those next three words with joy with me. He has risen. Big, big news. News worth us always pausing to celebrate the hope and the peace. In fact, there are folks who, uh, well, a friend of mine, rather, snarkily used to say, oh, we've got our C&E Christians with us today. I said, what's a C&E Christian? He said, they're the Christians that come on Christmas and Easter. C&E. That's when they show up. Now, if you haven't been here in a while, no shade thrown on you. We are glad you're here. Can I get an oh yeah from the church on that? We're thankful you're here. And by the way, this joyous celebration doesn't just take place on Easter. This This church has Easter every week. They celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every week. They lift up hands and say, praise God, He is risen every week. And I do hope you'll come back. Kevin Witham is a gifted, gifted pastor and preacher. Can I get an oh yeah from you all on that? Absolutely. And I'm so thankful every time I get a chance to hear Kevin. It's some of the best sleep. No, no. It is some of the best (laughs) encouragement I remember being a teenager and going to hear Kevin speak, so I am, (laughs) couldn't resist, bro. I am so honored to be here and to say, yes, this message that has changed everything continues and continues. You say, well, we don't really know when Jesus was born. Christmas, you know, some say it's September. You're right. Somebody put a finger on the map and picked that date, but not Easter. Easter both is connected to the Passover and the Jewish world, but also we look up and can see in Scripture when it happened. It was this time of year, and it was on a Sunday morning when 
the word of the disciples was, not He is risen. Their words were, it is over. It's done. All our hopes, all our dreams, we thought Jesus was going to be the one that would drive the Romans out of here. Say it with me. It is over. Maybe some of you fans have been watching a bit of March Madness and had to say that over and over again. Well, it's over for them. Well, it's over for them. Imagine if you'd staked years of your life on a moment that you thought was going to change everything and then it's over. We watched Him die. We've seen Him buried. And then the good news. The shock. The celebration. And some would say, and that's the big thing that happened on Easter. Well, I'll go with you, that's the big thing. But my phone probably would not have blown up about the small thing that happened on Easter. Because on that same day that they find Jesus empty, Luke goes right on to say, now that same, everybody say same day, so we're still on Easter, two of them, We're going to a village called Emmaus. Would you bow with me? Father, as we open and begin to walk into your word, I ask you to give us vision, memory, and hope. For Father, there are moments that all of us, in looking at what's happening in culture in our world, may feel a bit like those two travelers on the road to Emmaus. Like them, Father, may we encounter someone wonderful who can lift our eyes up to the big picture, I pray. And in Jesus' name, we all say, Amen. No, I don't think Luke wants us to stop at the resurrection. In fact, rather purposefully, He goes into a story that N.T. Wright, the well-known scholar, says is the best work Luke does. Now, seeing as God-inspired scripture, I'm not exactly sure how to take N.T.'s comment, but I'm just going to go with the fact that it's an impressively well-told story, and we get to share it today before this service is over. Two men on a road, and I'm going to dare to suggest this was not a trip they had planned. I'm going to dare to suggest that Cleopas and his unnamed buddy, because these weren't any of the big 12. This wasn't Peter and Andrew or James or John. This is Cleopas, and they even argue about, was he was that, was that Mary's uncle? How were they related? They're just two guys who were part of the larger disciples group. A group would have, that would have been nearly as many as are in this building right now. 200 that for following Jesus. 151.200 is called it another. So a large group that called themselves, we're that guy's disciples, long before anybody would call it the church. As a kid, I just got to ask, did you ever have a moment when you thought about running away? Did you ever have a moment of frustration with mom or dad? One of those moments where you, you I got to go, everyone's going, why can't I have this? I want a switchblade, you know, or, 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 or uh, I want one of those little motor, motorbikes, you know, Johnny's got one, Billy's got one, and your mom or dad, whoever says no. And within you, there welled up this feeling of injustice, of being mistreated. If you'd have had a phone back in those days, man, you'd have been taking pictures and videos. Here's my Hitler right here. Here's my oppressor. I I remember standing toe-to-toe with my father when there was something he wouldn't let me do, and I just... And I remember looking at him and saying something I shouldn't have said. I simply said, I wish I did not live here anymore. I was probably 15. And I didn't say it like that. I wish I didn't live here anymore. Only when I grew up and had kids did I know that my father was thinking the exact same thing (laughs) 
I, uh, <laughs> all right, I will use my phone. I, I, I stumbled across these. Uh, notes from kids who have run away. Uh, Emily, Mom, I'm going to run away tomorrow at 9.30 when you and Dad are sleeping. So be sure to say goodbye to Fever. That has to be the cat or something. Forever. Emily. P.S. I'll, we, I'll be back tonight. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is Joey. Dear Mom and Dad, I ran away. I'll be back soon. <laughs> Love, Joey. P.S. It's all Mom's fault. <laughs> and here's Daisy, who says, To Mom, I'm going to run away because you're being mean to me. If you want to know where I am, I'm at the Chick-fil-A or the McDonald's. <laughs> See you never again in my life. Daisy. I don't know if these guys had left a note or whether they just took off. He said, Jeff, what makes you think these guys are running away? Read with me, if you will, again, this text. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. They weren't, I don't think, going there on business. I could be wrong. Let me make sure you understand. This is just my opinion. But listen to the text when it says, here they were walking and they were talking with each other about the terrible, frustrating, difficult situation they were in. I know if somebody wants to get away, it's probably because they feel trapped or maybe hopeless. Maybe they're tired or hurting. So why did they leave Jerusalem? Now, now think about this. All their friends, all the disciples are in Jerusalem. There's been no persecution to send folks fleeing. What has happened is that Jesus died in front of them, buried. Where are the rest of the disciples? They're huddling in Jerusalem. These two say, that's it, we're getting out of town. I, I, I started listing things it could be, and maybe these are just things I wrestle with. Maybe it was fear, right? Maybe they said, oh my goodness, if they can do it to Jesus, they can do it to us. Maybe it's disappointment. There go all of my dreams. Maybe it was embarrassment. Maybe they didn't want somebody saying, oh yeah, remember when you told me Jesus is Lord, Jesus is going to change everything. Well, good luck, buddy. Or maybe just plain old confusion. Maybe the confusion like you and I feel right now as we look at what's happening in our world. Or maybe in our family. Maybe we're looking at what's happening inside of us. Maybe we've got to a certain age where we thought, man, I thought my faith would be stronger. And the next YouTube comes up that says how stupid it is to be a Christian. Or the next brilliant scientist, they often have English accents, I don't know why, but who is explaining why it's just so foolish to believe in Jesus because of blah, 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 blah. Or foolish to believe in God. And we click off the video but still sit there and think, I don't know what to think. And I can't say that out loud because I'm a Christian, right? But I'm maybe feeling a little bit of the embarrassment or confusion that these two might well have felt. So here was their idea. We're just going to get out of town. We're going to get away. Oh, I relate to that. There are moments when I still want to run away from home. Honey, this is not about you. Let me, let me, let me be clear. Because that, that vision of just run away is something that comes very natural to us, right? Fight or flight. And if you feel like you can't fight, then all you can do is run. And what's ironic to us is these two men are running away from the most amazing, marvelous thing. What are they running towards? <laughs> One scholar takes the word Emmaus and said it is closest to a word that means despised and outcast. Great name for a city, right? A chamber of Commerce would love that. Come to despised and outcast for your vacation. It, maybe it's him looking over his shoulder and saying, well, that's what maybe they were feeling. So they walk and they talk. And as they talked and discussed these things, everybody say things, these things with each other, what had happened? 
the imprisonments first of some of the disciples, and them getting out, and the angel, and then Jesus, and then, and then Peter running away. Jesus Himself came up and walked along with them. Can you just go with me in your mind? You're walking on this road, and a stranger shows up. Maybe you didn't hear him coming, shows up behind you. Walks up, and maybe he says, may I walk with you? Or maybe it's just that kind of begrudging, hey there. And the three of you are now a walking group. And the Bible says they didn't recognize... No, that's actually not what the Bible says. I've said, had people say they didn't recognize him. But they were... Do you see what the text on the screen says? They were kept from recognizing him. I think that's Jesus saying, I'm going to do undercover boss for a few minutes here. I want to walk with guys who are supposed to be my disciples, and if they don't know, it's me. Kevin, wouldn't that be fun, Right? On a Sunday, or maybe not, I don't know. For the preacher to be able to be standing out there and all of a sudden no one would recognize you and just hear the comments. I, oh man, this has been a long time ago. This this happened in uh, North Carolina. And I was uh, speaking at a a retreat or an event of some kind, a Carolina Christian conference. Anyway, the bunch of kids uh, at this hotel. And it was a really large group, so the, the podium was quite away from them as far as the ones that were sitting at the back, I'm in the elevator coming down for one of the sessions. I'm not dressed up, and I'm standing with my arms folded. And one of them says, who's speaking tonight? And the other one says, same guy as last night. And the other one says, we're going to be late again. And the other one says, yeah, he was funny though. And another kid said, at first, then he quit being funny. And the doors opened and they walked out, having blessed my life. Because <laughs> I can't get that elevator out of my mind, you know? They were saying just what was on their mind. And so Jesus kind of does the same thing. In fact, it's, it's interesting. He says to them, well, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Oh, He, he just kind of baits them. And the Bible says... They stood still. All of a sudden, they just stopped. And their faces were downcast. One version said that Jesus even makes a comment about this. But but they stopped, and they're just looking like... (sighs) It's like you just walked out of this person's mother's funeral, and you see them, oh, hey, what's wrong? Are you totally clueless? I mean, listen, listen to their language. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these days? We'd say, man, what's wrong with you? Where have you been? You've been under a rock for the last three days? Jesus would say, yes, actually, I I, I was. (laughs) What are you discussing as you walk along? And they they share that. What things? I mean, he he just plays dumb. What things, he asked, and they start in. Now, this is the scary moment, because Jesus is here, they don't know it's him, and he's basically said, tell me my story. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Wow, that's, that's a pretty good start. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Jesus, yeah, that's that's true. And here's the words that have to break Jesus' heart. Can you read these words with me? But we had hope. Just, just, Just let that sink in for a moment. Yeah, he was this, he was this, he was great, he was powerful, and then they got him, and then they killed him, and then they buried him, and Jesus is waiting for them to say, and and he's resurrected, and we're out looking for him. No, I think Jesus knows. Because they say, but we, we'd hoped that he was going to be the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had 
Have you been there? Mm. We'd hoped that it wasn't going to be malignant. We'd hoped she was going to be able to beat the addiction. We hoped that he was going to stay faithful to his family. We hoped our finances would be better. We'd hoped the, the landlord would have cut us some slack. We'd hope that by now, I'd hope that by now, I would have had somebody in my life, somebody to be a partner with me. We'd hope that at this point in our retirement, well, we'd be healthier. Well, we'd have more opportunity. We hoped our kids would come see us. We had hoped. A few things worse to me and the sense of a loss of hope. And yet, maybe there is something worse than losing hope. You say, what could it possibly be? Listen as they continue. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. And they came and told us, that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it, just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Okay, pause a second. What's wrong with this picture? Jesus is here, resurrected, walking with them, and they say, and you're never going to believe what somebody said. The women went there and, you know, they didn't find him. Well, you know, who's going to believe a grieving woman? You know, they could have even gone to the wrong tomb. Who knows? But then some of our companions, read men, some of our companions went there and they looked and Jesus wasn't there either. What is missing? No wonder Jesus kind of chides them a little bit with his next line. Are you foolish people? You actually know the story. You know what's worse than losing hope? Losing the ability to have faith. Losing the ability to believe in that which we cannot see. Losing the ability to believe when someone says, excuse me, what? Well, God became flesh, born of a virgin, lived 33 years, was a miracle worker, prophet, God in flesh, and then was Wrongly convicted, beaten, tortured, crucified, and buried in a grave. And three days later, he rose and and showed himself to people. And there were angels that affirmed it. Really? Yeah, really. In fact, if you keep going... He tells those people to share the word. And they began to share the word. And a movement blossomed out of the the desert that is on every, every corner of the planet. You can find people who in one version or another will say, I believe in Jesus. It is a worldwide phenomenon. Launched by a guy who never wrote a book, who never led an army, who never traveled as far as from San Diego to Pepperdine. A guy who has never ever held an office as far as the, the world is concerned. Who had no power as far as the Romans were concerned. Who didn't go to college. This guy, this blue collar kid, changed our world. And if you could fast forward to here, (laughs) I always thought, man, if if time travel works, the first place I'm going is to the hill called Golgotha. Because there's a Roman soldier who's going to be standing, staring up at a Jew that he just helped to put up there. And I'm going to lean over and say, you want to make a bet? (laughs) What? 2,000 years from now, who's going to be more famous? That dying Jew? Or Caesar? Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Caesar's going to be more famous. 2,000 years later, millions all over the world pray, and they use the name. Millions all over the world cuss, and they use the name. Yeah. And we have children, and we name them after the followers of Jesus, or some named actually. Do we have a Jesus in the house? Jesus, all right. 
And as long as we're at it, do we have a Matthew first or middle name? Or do you have a brother, sister, close friend named Mark or Luke or John? Raise your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, you've hired Luke, John. How about a Mary? Do we have any Marys or extended family Marys? 2,000 years later, we name our children Peter, Paul, Mary, John, and we name our dogs Cesar. (laughs) Or Nero. But you see, these guys were right in, I mean, it was right in front of them. And they said, we don't believe. Well, now wait a minute, Jeff, it doesn't say they don't believe. Which way are they walking? They're walking away from Jerusalem. And even as they talk about it, they talk about it like, oh, and then you, you, you're never going to guess what happened next. People started saying, oh, the tomb is empty. And yeah, some of our friends ran there and the tomb is empty, but they didn't see Jesus. Oh, they latch onto that. Of course, then again, I haven't seen Jesus either. Despite what we sing at camp, right? Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look. Open. He'll show it to... Oh my goodness, I'm back at Camp Tonda all of a sudden, sitting around a fire. These two gentlemen had gotten to a place where they had no hope, and where they could not muster any faith. So what does Jesus do? (laughs) Jesus is going to give them what they need. Okay, he's going to chide them a little bit. You can hardly blame him, right? He says to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said, help me now, in all of Scripture concerning... What he did is he said, guys, 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 you're right here. You're saying, oh my goodness, this has happened, that's happened, and I don't know what to do. He says, for just a minute, get your eyes off that. And let's look at the big picture. Let's look at what we read when we read Moses' story. Let's look at the Exodus. Let's look at who the prophet said was coming. Let's look at the one that Abraham's seed was going to change the world. They backed that picture up as Jesus walked with them and gave him the best Old Testament course anybody could have ever had. Can I get a, oh yeah? Listen, you can get a degree in Old Testament. And have a great Old Testament course at Pepperdine University and many other fine Christian colleges. But this, oh, what a blessing. In fact, by the time they get to to the end they're staying at, they're like, whoa, because it seems he's going to walk on. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. They beg him. You ever been in one of those conversations like on a plane or in a car where you're having such a great conversation with somebody you don't want to get there? You don't want it to stop. Oh, we're landing. And you think, oh man, I want to talk more with this person. They begged him. I love this line. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued as if he's going farther, but they urged him strongly. Please say these words with me. Stay with us. One more time. This is you pleading, Jesus, can I get a little more time with you? Stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When's the last time you begged Jesus? Stay a little longer, Savior. Or maybe, Jesus, it's cold outside. Can't can't you just stay? Or maybe the better way to put it is, When's the last time Jesus knocked on the door of your heart and you just took time to pray and be with Him? When's the last time you opened up God's Word and weren't trying to get my ten minutes of reading in, but found yourself reading the words of Jesus and you just didn't want to leave? 
So he does. And if I can just pause and do 30 seconds on that, all you need to do is ask Jesus. And he's happy to be with you. He desires to be with you. Like God coming and looking for Adam and Eve in Genesis, Jesus comes to look for these two men. It's like the whole script is flipped. Because Jesus wants to be with you in your darkness, in your discomfort, in your lack of hope, in your struggling faith. But I wonder if this story is meant in part to tell us, but Jesus is not going to be your grandmother. Get out of that bed, we're going to church. Come on, let's go. You remember that, right? It was told of the mom who was banging on her son's door. We are going to be late. And she opened the bedroom window and he's got one foot. Her son has one foot out the, out the window. What are you doing? I'm running away. I don't want to go to church anymore. Get yourself back in here. You're not, I can't go to church. Why can't you go to church? Nobody at that church likes me. Nobody does. Nobody talks to me hardly ever after church is over. I got to go find people to talk to. She said, get yourself in here. She said, give me one good reason why. Because you're the preacher. Get in here and we're going. (laughs) Jesus comes in and the Bible says that he sets down with them. And when he was at the table, he took the bread. Oh, what a moment. He gave thanks. Does this sound familiar? And he what? broke it you just watch the first broken bread since his burial and he began to give it to them in the moment of jesus passing what we might call the first communion the bible says their eyes were opened they recognized him and boom he disappears mike drop You've been told. And they turned to each other like, whoa, what a, how the... And then one of them says, were not our hearts, say the word, burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. I don't know if it's true, but I wonder if that's not some of the thought. That old hymn my grandma used to sing. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the here falling the Son of God. Listen to it. Discloses and walks with me and he I don't ever want you to hear her sing that old hymn again without thinking of these fellows walking on that road with Jesus and they say weren't our hearts burnt? didn't we just feel it didn't we just know when he was on the road and opened the scriptures to us this morning it is my prayer that we can all get on the road let me just give you as we finish two, two truths about the road Number one, it's not as bad as you think right now. You say, preacher, you don't have any idea what I'm going through. You don't have any idea what our doctor, or you don't have any idea what my husband or wife, it is not as bad as you think. These two thought, it's over, it's done. And the reason it's not as bad as you think, because Jesus is not as far away as you think. He's closer than you can even imagine. Close enough to where all you need to do is say, Savior. And He wraps you in His holy arms. And He comforts us. Whether at a graveside, or a bedside, or the place where we buried a dream. Whether in a moment of torn relationships, or emotions that are tearing us apart. The scripture again and again says, just call on the name of the Lord. What do you need? 
faith, what, what these men needed. Scripture says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Can I get an oh yeah? Scripture also says if you believe and have faith, nothing is impossible for you. I, I love the juxtaposition of those impossible terms. It all comes down to this. What do you believe about the Jesus of Easter? And if you're the runaway, if you've been running away from the resurrection, I love the fact that this story isn't the prodigal son where the father patiently waits and if the boy comes back, then he's going to... And that's beautiful. But in this story, it is the Jesus who comes and finds you and me. Oh, what it would have been like. Today, that's yours if you want it. You don't need to drive home alone. (laughs) You don't need to head out of here by yourself. Because Jesus wants to be with you. This hit me. Jesus is just resurrected and he can go anywhere and do anything. Right? He could appear before Caesar and say, ha you were wrong. He could have appeared in the temple and said, priests, look at me. He'd gone to any court in the land. He could have floated in the clouds above Jerusalem and said, I am who I said I was. He could have appeared to his mother. He could have appeared to anybody. But I love the fact that he goes to two no-name guys, at least one no-name guy, and whoever Cleopas is. And like the two in the garden, God comes to walk with them. But unlike the mess where they say, I and run and hide, these two say, oh, didn't our hearts burn? I wish I had the words to close by telling you how much Jesus loves you. Right now, right here, right where you are. I wish I had the words to say, this is how God cares for you. So, whether the resurrection story is, well, just too tough to explain, too embarrassing to embrace, too scary to accept, I believe that history says it is too powerful to ignore. So let's finish my vain attempt at going back to that conversation. Imagine. We're walking on the road with Jesus. Would you, gentlemen? And he is about to do some uh, explaining. I want you to imagine hearing the voice of Jesus as he opens the Old Testament and tells them that it is not a series of disconnected stories. But rather, it's a single narrative in which every story, every character, points beyond itself to one who is greater. The story of Adam and Eve is not just about the first man and woman. There is a true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden, and his obedience is ascribed to us. There is a true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. There is a true and better Abraham, who answered the call of God to leave all that was comfortable and familiar and go out into the void to create a new people of God. Jesus says there was a true and better Isaac, the son of laughter of grace, who was not just offered up by his father on the mountain, but was truly sacrificed for you. There is a true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice that we deserve. So we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. There's a true and better Joseph who stood at the right hand of the king forgiving those who sold him and uses his new power to save them. There's a true and better Moses who stands in the gap between the people of the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. And there is a true and better rock of Moses struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. He said there's a true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer who 
and intercedes for us and saves his foolish friends. There's a true and better David whose victory becomes the people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it. There is a true and better Esther who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, who didn't risk his life, but gave his life to save his people. Oh, there is a true and better Jonah who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. There is a true and better Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain, so the angel of death will pass over us. Maybe he said here he's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, and the true bread. And now they know, and we know. The Bible's not a series of disconnected stories, but a single narrative that points to one name. Say it with me. Jesus. Jesus. Bow your head. Father, thank you today. Thank you for the beauty of of the Old Testament. And thank you for a peek behind the veil when Jesus said, let me tell you, it's about me. But not the me on the cross. Not the me whipped or mocked. It is about the me resurrected, ascended, and calling from heaven. Please come dine with me. Father, I pray for any here who have never given their heart and life to Jesus. I pray for any here who need prayers, who are saying, Jeff, you, you turned over some stones. I'm, I'm aching because of a lack of hope, because of feeling trapped. And yeah, I do kind of want to run away. Or maybe those who have already made that commitment to Jesus in baptism, and yet Satan has lured us off the road and tempted us with a side trip away. Father, I pray that they would find one of the pastors or one of the elders here, the minister, they would say, can you pray with me today? And God, for anyone here who's never been baptized into Jesus, I pray that today they mark Easter Sunday 2024 with a celebration by saying, I, I want to take a step and give my life to Him. Father, may we move from hope to faith, and to conviction of the big picture. And as we see it, may we shout, He is risen. And in the name of the conquering King, of the Lord who loves us, of the Jesus who died and rose and has prepared heaven for us, all that agree say, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and say it together. He is risen. One more time. Amen.